Okay, fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for inviting me to be uh, a part of, uh, of this uh, conversation today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, this pandemic, which has preoccupied uh, pretty much all of our attention uh, every day for uh, you know most of this year. Um, and I'm going to be talking about turning data into insights and insights into action and some of the challenges uh, around that, uh, particularly when you're dealing with complex ideas and, and issues, which I think obviously um, is really core to the work that uh, the important work that uh, so many of you are doing. Um, I'm assuming since you already gave the introduction, maybe I'll just very briefly say I kind of wear a few different hats. I'm a practicing infectious disease physician. Uh, I'm a professor uh, with the Faculty of Medicine and the School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and um, I'm the founder and CEO of Blue Dot, a health tech company here uh, in downtown Toronto. So I'm going to just start out with uh, something that is today pretty abundantly obvious, uh, but maybe wasn't as obvious uh, a year ago, that outbreaks can appear without notice and can rapidly spread across the entire planet. Uh, who would have thought that here we are today, you know, as we turned uh, into the new decade in 2020, that within a short period of time, the entire planet would be crippled by, uh, you know, this tiny virus that you could fit thousands of on the head of a pin. Uh, but this is where we are today. And what this really highlights is that if the world wants to stay a step ahead of these types of threats, uh, we are going to have to move faster and we're going to have to move smarter. Um, now, on one hand, you know, there are uh, emerging diseases are increasing in frequency, uh, in scale and, and in impact. In the last 10 years alone, the Wor World Health Organization has declared six outbreaks to be global public health emergencies. So that's an average of about one emergency every two years. Uh, so this is a, a growing challenge because of uh, many different factors from population growth and urbanization and climate change, the industrialization of agriculture. There's a wide array of different factors and the confluence of these factors are driving the emergence and spread of diseases at a pace uh, that we have never seen before. Um, now, on the other hand, there is some reason for optimism, and that is because we are also in an era where we have growing access to data, advanced analytical capabilities like machine learning and other digital technologies, uh, where we could literally generate uh, and disseminate knowledge around the world faster uh, than any outbreak can spread. But in order to do that, we need to actually build a global system that can produce this kind of intelligence. Now, as a physician, um, you know, I spent uh, 10 years um, working as a uh, clinician and a scientist um, based out of St. Michael's Hospital, uh, studying outbreaks after the 2003 SARS outbreak that some of you may recall. Um, you know, we often don't think about it, but that was the first novel coronavirus outbreak in the world. And I had a chance to kind of experience and witness that virus uh, up close uh, in 2003 when I just began my career as an infectious disease physician. But after 10 years, I took a leap of faith and founded a uh, company called Blue Dot, as I mentioned earlier. And what we have been focused on is building a global epidemic intelligence system that can help the world react more quickly uh, than uh, we have in the past, because this is essentially a necessity for us. If we're going to stay in front of these threats, uh, ultimately, we're going to have to move uh, faster than we have before. Now, I'm going to just describe a little bit about three core pillars of this intelligence platform, uh, and I'm going to just touch upon them at a fairly high level. The first pillar is really about gathering data and intelligence from different parts of the world, um, not only in terms of where infectious disease outbreaks and threats may be appearing, but other data that can help contextualize what kind of risks those various threats present locally or globally. The second pillar is, uh, is based on data analytics and taking diverse data from infectious disease activity data, global transportation networks, demographics, climate, and other factors to try and understand what sort of impact, what, what patterns of spread we might observe, uh, so we can anticipate where these threats might be moving to next, but then also ultimately what impacts they may have 
and what sort of interventions we can engage in to mitigate their impacts. The third piece really is an area that's fairly nascent in our uh, area of work, but I think is really core to all of the great work that you do, which is how do you take complex information, often you know health information or information about a microbe, and communicate it to an array of different audiences. And keeping in mind when you're talking about a pandemic, those audiences span the entire planet, uh, different languages and cultures and so forth, but they also span different sectors. This is not just for government, but it's also these insights are necessary to empower the public, to empower frontline healthcare workers, to empower uh, businesses uh, that um, are impacted by uh, an outbreak or this pandemic. So I'm going to start out by just talking a little bit about some of the work that we have been doing to generate uh, infectious disease intelligence uh, using AI to really uh, reduce the number of blind spots that we have in the world and to gather this type of information in near real time. Now, the way we've been approaching this is that historically, um, information on infectious disease activity came through sort of official reports. This is where public health agencies would have a list of what are called notifiable diseases, and then they would report information about how many cases there were and so forth. Uh, we've, you know, our team of data engineers have been working to uh, extract data from a wide array of global public health entities um, and to organize and centralize all of this information. But to complement that, because we know that the official reports uh, are typically verified, but they may not be timely. And so we've been complementing that with unofficial information. And the internet has become an important medium for collecting data and gathering information about infectious disease activity that may precede the official reports that are coming out of government. Uh, we have been using natural language processing and machine learning to gather data on over 150 different diseases and toxins and syndromes. And we've been gathering and processing this data in 65 different languages and doing so every 15 minutes around the clock. This is including health forums and blogs, the world's online media, and a wide array of unofficial sources. But as you can imagine, all of this data is highly unstructured. And so this is where machine learning and AI can take these data, help us eliminate things that are low relevant. So for example, the word uh, plague may be used in a way that is referring to an outbreak or it may have some other meaning. And this is where machines can actually do a lot of that work to eliminate background noise, to eliminate duplications of the same information coming over and over again and allow us to organize and structure all of this data. Uh, this system actually was the one that had picked up information about uh, a, an unusual pneumonia circulating in a city called Wuhan back in late December, translated the information and then flagged it to our team of subject matter experts who are physicians, veterinarians and uh, epidemiologists. So when we looked at that information, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment, I was gonna say, we're not only collecting information on outbreaks around the world and not just this type of syndrome, but every single day, outbreaks of meningitis or measles or pertussis uh, across the globe. But in order to put those outbreaks into context, we need to have some additional data. So what we have been doing is working with uh, data on human population mobility, because we know these types of threats can jump across international borders or even across continents in a matter of hours or days. Uh, what we have done is we have integrated data on the world's travel patterns through commercial air travel, um, but all, using billions every single year, about four plus billion flight itineraries. This year, of course, is a year where we are seeing a lot less travel but also the anonymized locations of hundreds of millions of mobile phones across the globe. Uh, we've been integrating a wide array of other data, demographics, population density, animal populations as reservoirs for human disease, microbes, uh, sorry, vectors that can, trans, uh, can infect uh, individuals with uh, viruses and other types of microbes, real-time climate conditions from terrestrial sensors as well as um, uh, remote sensing. Uh, and health system capacity. So all of these diverse data were never really intended to be integrated together. So there's a lot of spatial and temporal integration of these data so that we can cross-reference key points uh, to understand whether a mosquito is gonna be able to survive 
long enough in late November to be able to actually transmit a particular disease in one geography versus another geography, or even how that may change over seasons and time. I'm gonna just show a couple of examples here of some data analytics, because I could probably spend a few hours alone just in this particular area, but I'll, I'll go through this at a fairly uh, high level. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, when this article was written in The Economist, you can see there it says by 2020, 80% of adults will have a super computer in their pocket. Well, here we are in 2020 um, and smartphones are now obviously uh, um, uh, prevalent across the globe. And so we have been working with anonymous data. I do wanna highlight, you know, following all privacy regulations and laws. Um, and, and uh, analyzing these data in aggregate to understand how populations may be moving for, across different geographies and intersecting that with the locations of outbreaks that are appearing across the planet. I'm gonna just show you an example of how when we had first picked up the outbreak in Wuhan, uh, we immediately started to look at these mobile uh, device location data here. And so what I'm going to show you are devices that over the next four that were in Wuhan and where they appeared in the next 14 days. Um, and you will see uh, a number that's Wuhan there in Hubei province. And you will see places like uh, Tokyo and Seoul and Shanghai and uh, certainly in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Now, this is day over day through the month of December. And so, as well as places like Bangkok. Um, and what this really highlighted for us, so these are some of the places that we should be looking to next if this outbreak were to spread outside of mainland China. Now, I also wanted to point out that we have been doing a lot of work to connect the location of every outbreak in, on the, in the planet with the movements of populations to neighboring airports because Humans move either by ground, you know, bus, you know, by car, by train, et cetera, but they can then jump to an airport and make these leaps across vast distances. And so these analytics across the entire globe are taking into consideration local road networks, mountain ranges, bodies of water, international borders, and so forth, so that we can geolocate and relate the location of an outbreak to the probability that people will use neighboring airports in the surrounding area. And as you can imagine, the further away that you go, the less likely you are to travel there, as well as the size of the airport can actually be an important draw. You're more likely to go to Pearson, for example, than to drive to Buffalo. You might go to Buffalo, but you're more likely to go to Pearson because it's closer and more accessible. Now, what we've engineered is the ability then to connect this across the globe with each outbreak to the neighboring airports and then automatically analyze the world's travel data with all flight schedules across the planet, but also the, again, anonymized passenger level flight itineraries of over 4 billion tickets that was in 2019 sold across the planet. And these tickets include the flight connections to the final destination of the traveler. So it's not just following the aircraft, but understanding how, uh, how people are traveling around the world. So this map here, was generated actually in just about a second uh, on December 31st, or at least all of the analytics were generated in about a second, um, looking at the arcs. These are the nonstop flights, and you'll see places like into California and into New York City uh, over uh, in our neck of the woods. And then there's a whole bunch of places uh, in Italy and France and the UK and so forth uh, in Europe. But you'll see many of those large circles are in um, East Asia. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Now, we were sufficiently concerned about this initial news, uh, given that there were a number of parallels with the SARS outbreak, uh, that we actually published this article. We don't, we don't do that for every uh, outbreak that we see, but this really caused a significant amount of concern on our end. And we published this, which actually turns out to be the world's first peer-reviewed scientific study published on COVID-19. Now you can see from the title, it doesn't even have, we don't even know what it is at this point in time. It's a pneumonia of unknown etiology. And so using some of those analytics, we identify the top 20 places that we think if the outbreak is actually going to spread, here are the places we should be looking to next. Now keeping in mind 
We only hear that there are about 27 cases on December 31st, and then it's 40 some odd cases a few days later. But our concern is maybe we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg, which is not unusual and not uncommon when you're dealing with newly emerging diseases where you don't have diagnostic testing capabilities and so forth. So what you'll see with these red dots are these are the cities that were among the very first to be impacted by COVID-19. Bangkok at the top of our list was in fact the very first city outside of mainland China to have an imported case of COVID-19. Tokyo was number two, that came three days later and you can see it's number three on our list. Um, and so this was a way for us to start anticipating uh, where this virus might spread to next. And we actually had already submitted this for publication on January 8th, and it was then published about five days later, um, uh, still in the first half of January. Now, as we think of those arcs, uh, one of the arcs went into California. And as you know, the state of California was one of the first that had the, well, it was the first that had the stay at home orders in the United States. Um, and in fact, our analytics, um, had identified flows of travelers into places like um, San Francisco uh, and to Los Angeles. San Francisco had that nonstop flight. Uh, and it turns out the first death in the United States was in Santa Clara County, just outside of uh, the area where the San Francisco airport is located. And then, of course, there were arc, that arc as well into New York City, which we know was also really at the epicenter of the uh, pandemic in the United States. Now, what we're looking at here are mobile device locations that once they actually move a couple of hundred meters outside of their home location where the device is actually resting over the middle of the night, then uh, we're actually picking those uh, devices up. Now we're aggregating them. And again, as I mentioned, they're all anonymized. Um, but what this is doing here is this is our work with the state of California when the stay at home orders were happening and there was a need to understand, well, you know, is the stay at home orders, are they working? Uh, where maybe are they working? Where are they not? And so what we're looking at here is the larger the circles are, the larger number of devices that have now left home or their home location overnight. The blue circles indicate that the number of devices has decreased since the stay at home order uh, has been uh, recommended. And the red circles indicate that the number of devices has increased. And so what this did was to help identify places like uh, gathering in parks, in grocery stores, um, in uh, healthcare facilities and hospitals to give the public health officials the intelligence to understand where and when are, are, uh, is crowding potentially taking place uh, and how do they adjust their, um, uh, their messaging and use their finite human resources in the most effective way. So I'm gonna go on to the last uh, sort of pillar here about risk communication. Uh, which is, uh, you know, I think we have learned during this pandemic just how critical this is, especially when we're dealing with complex information and, uh, and time is, is really critical. Now, I'm just going to um, share with you how information typically flows and how I think it shouldn't be flowing and, and what needs to happen. Now, when there is an outbreak that occurs, typically the first entity that actually hears about this is the public health agencies in government. And that's largely because that's their mandate. Uh, they, they're responsible for looking at the health of populations. We have certainly learned in our work that many governments still don't have the surveillance capabilities to actually do this work as uh, perhaps they need to, uh, because they're not resourced appropriately, and it's hard to develop the kind of innovations uh, inside government that, that perhaps they need. Uh, there is a trickle down, and then this information tends to reach the healthcare community. And I remember this because December 31st, I was thinking about what was happening in Wuhan. But when I talked to my peers, uh, many of them actually didn't even know that uh, what Wuhan was or that there was something actually happening there uh, in the days thereafter, in the early months, uh, early, early days uh, in, in January. Now, that's, of course, problematic because sick patients don't go to the public health department. They they wind up in the emergency department and we need our clinicians to be able to anticipate what may be coming their way. Industry tends to find out about this next, uh, but this is really important. Airlines, airports, other types of businesses need to be thinking about the safety of their employees, uh, business continuity and, and the financial resilience they need 
uh, to make sure that they are protecting the livelihoods of their employees and their customers. And then, of course, the public tends to find out about this, and, and this often happens even later still. Now, we've always envisioned that we need a different approach, not a waterfall approach where information is gradually getting from one sector to the next to the next. When we say we're all in this together, we need to be able to actually mobilize and empower all these different uh, segments of society so we can all do our part. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, first of all, there are what we refer to as these population health custodians. This is the government uh, and the public health agencies, obviously looking after the health of the public itself, but private uh, industries are also looking after uh, the health of their employees and in many cases, the health of their customers. So there's another channel or conduit uh, for us to be able to disseminate insights. And as I mentioned, Blue Dot has been working with uh, many different private sector organizations in the travel sector, uh, like airlines, like airports, like companies that produce medical supplies that wanna make sure they're in the right place at the right time. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunity to, uh, to be engaging uh, these different uh, se uh, segments of society. But we also, as I mentioned earlier, need to get these insights to the frontline healthcare workers who need to do this to protect themselves and to protect the rest of us. And then, of course, how do we put the public in public health uh, and really empower our citizens to be uh, taking the actions that they need to, again, protect themselves and their families, uh, but also be protecting the rest of their communities? So I'm gonna just show you a piece of technology that we've developed for that population health custodian. This is really just a front end. Uh, it's a global dashboard that is using all the back end analytics that I described to be scanning information about infectious disease activity and threats around the world, not just of COVID, but all these various diseases and syndromes. They're all geolocated and timestamped. They're fully integrated with the world's travel data. And so, any organization can then configure the view of the world to their particular location or the nature of their business. So um, if I'm here in Toronto and I'm working in a hospital, I can look at threats that would be relevant to me in Toronto. You know, maybe a threat in some part of Bolivia uh, is, is, is interesting, but the probability that it's going to show up in my geographic area is extremely low based on all the information I described about connectivity, population movements, travel, and so forth. Um, so this is a, a mechanism by which we can actually um, relate infectious disease activity to the location, to any location in the world, and, and do this in a scalable way uh, because we are taking a global panoramic view of infectious disease activity and risk. This is where the magic of data engineering and our data scientists come in, where all the pieces of data are broken into small bite sizes. You can almost follow them day over do day, but do this in a scale where we're, we're doing this across uh, the planet and across over 150 different diseases. Now, um, that's a lot of information, and I wanted to kind of leave this um, uh, Frank Zappa quote with you, uh, but I thought the, the top part of it might be most pertinent to you, that information, of course, and this is, I'm sure, very, um, uh, something you're all very aware of, that information is not knowledge and, and knowledge is not wisdom. Uh, Frank Zappa goes on to tell us that music is the best, which uh, I think we could probably all agree upon. Um, but this is really uh, just important uh, to recognize uh, that we need to turn information into something that is actionable and meaningful and easily consumable by these different audiences. If we do not do that, then the potential uh, of that particular information or that insight uh, is lost and the benefit is, uh, is not realized. Now, we are often dealing with complex information. I just you know, put up this image here. This is looking at a uh, Rift Valley fever and the life cycle. You know, these are complicated concepts. You know, when you look at something like this, I'm an infectious disease specialist. It's, this even makes me kind of feel a bit dizzy thinking about, all right, well, there are these animals and then there's some mosquitoes and then their eggs are laid and maybe it has something to do with the climate and then people get infected in the following multiple different ways. This is complex information, but we need to make it simple uh, for people to understand and simple to understand, well, what action should they be taking? Uh, and this is, of course, why the work you're doing is so important. Now, I wanted to just speak to two areas, just in the interest of time. 
One is the frontline healthcare worker and the other is uh, just a health consumer themselves, the citizens out there that are not subject matter experts. So I you know, regularly work in these kind of environments. They're chaotic, uh, they're busy, uh, there's a lot going on, um, but it is critical that your frontline healthcare worker, when they encounter that patient who has a dangerous communicable disease, that they actually know what they're looking at and they know exactly how to protect themselves and they know how to protect the patient and they know how to protect everyone else in the hospital and in the community. Now, this is something we might just assume, you know, they got it, no problem. Uh, everyone's trained and, and uh, all good. I will tell you, I mean, I went to the University of Toronto for, for medical uh, school. Uh, this is considered one of the best medical schools in the world. Um, and I think I got about half a day or a day of tropical medicine in my entire four years. Um, you know, most of us do not get uh, a lot of time uh, worrying about diseases like loss of fever or leptospirosis, and we might not even, you know, have ever even heard of them, let alone know about an outbreak that's happening halfway around the planet uh, when we're, you know, uh, distracted by all of the things that are happening in front of us. So we have envisioned that one way to really empower our healthcare workers is through an early warning. Give them a heads up. This is something you need to pay attention to. And the other is every time a patient walks through the front door of the hospital or into the emergency department, they go through a triage process. And one of the questions is, have you traveled somewhere recently? Um, how do we actually empower the triage nurse or the doc in the emergency department so they know what to be thinking about when someone has come from Nigeria or Bangladesh or somewhere else with an unusual uh, uh, febrile illness. And this is a problem for a couple of reasons. This is not a self-serving statement as an infectious disease doctor, but the number of infectious disease doctors are actually in decline. Uh, and this is problematic because you don't have a lot of people who are experienced and trained in these areas. And as I mentioned earlier, we are just overloaded with information so one more alert is just too many alerts. And so the information may be there in front of us, but we just can't actually even see it. So I think you know, this, this uh, quote from a professor at NYU is important and even pertinent to, to your work, of course. Um, it's really about how do you reduce the noise so that people can actually hear or, or see, if you will, what um, is most important to them and to understand how to act. Um, this uh, alert and notification is uh, a real alert that went out uh, to um, all of our various users of our technology. And you can see it here, December 31st, it's before 10 a.m. Uh, so we actually had you know, picked this up and within two hours, uh, all of our partners and clients and users around the planet uh, were aware of this. Now, what we normally do, we sent this out to everyone because we were concerned about it. But normally what we do is we send it out if it's relevant to you, if this thing poses a threat to your location, or if you just happen to want to know about every case of Ebola in the world, even if it's not likely to show up in Toronto, uh, you know, we can actually uh, configure the information uh, in a way that is uh, consumable for you. The second piece here is about smarter triage. I'm just mindful of time, so I will kind of move through the last few bits uh, you know, a little bit uh, more quickly. Uh, so smarter triage, and this is where all of our underlying data, not only about outbreaks, but what we call endemic uh, disease transmission, places where you know there may not be an outbreak of malaria reported, but we know that malaria transmits in different parts of the globe, in Latin America and Asia and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we can overlay and integrate that with all the outbreaks that are being picked up in real time and incorporate attributes of the pathogen, things like its incubation period and clinical manifestations. And we've already built out some APIs uh, or data services where a clinician can query our platform and say, my patient was just here, you know, they were traveling on these dates, uh, you know, what things should I be thinking about? Because I only got half a day of trot medicine in my entire medical career. Uh, what do I think about? Or my patient's going to this location, how do I advise them? Uh, so that they can stay healthy um, and, and not acquire an illness uh, during the course of their travels. This is just to kind of share with you that we've been working hard on developing some of the front ends of how we can actually uh, present this in a way that integrates into the workflows of the clinician and can generate the type of information that helps them um, assess 
conditions that maybe they were hadn't thought about or maybe even were you know, never even heard of before. Um, and so I'm going to just uh, uh, wrap up here with this point about, you know, this passage from the Talmud about, you know, one person and whoever saves a single life, it is sort of considered as if they have saved the entire world. These, these words are particularly profound during a pandemic when we recognize that a pandemic starts with just one person. Um, but how could we empower the public and individuals in a way so that they actually can take the actions that they need to protect themselves, their family members, those close to them, wherever they might be in the world. And this is another area of active work um, where we have been developing uh, applications to, to um, empower individual travelers wherever they might be, or even for diseases that are just showing up in your geographic location, whether you're traveling or not. It could be a particular strain of influenza that is uh, dangerous to you. And what we've done here is personalize the insights so that we're integrating things like key risk factors. You know, a pregnant woman would have a very different view of the world than, you know, an 80 year old or a two year old, for example. Uh, and so these are ways that we're looking at um, engaging the public in protecting themselves, uh, but also protecting um, those close to them and the communities around them. Because ultimately we are inadvertently we are actually contributing to the, the spread of disease as we move from one part of the planet to the next. So uh, I'm going to wrap up here just with a bit of a summary um, to say, you know, on one hand, threats are appearing with greater frequency. Uh, they're becoming uh, larger in scale and more disruptive, uh, as we see with uh, COVID-19. Uh, but there are opportunities to, uh, to harness data and analytics and technology in ways that we've never been able to before. Uh, to move faster and to move smarter. And this is what we have been doing at Blue Dot uh, for seven years, day in and day out. This is all we do is uh, just thinking about ways to actually uh, prepare for and respond to the next set of threats. But I'm gonna end with this point, which is again, so pertinent to uh, the significance and value of the work that you're doing is that the intelligence and this information uh, these insights have to be translated into actions. And I think we have seen during this pandemic that this is a, a formidable challenge to, to do this across global geographies and to empower different uh, segments of society from the decision makers in government uh, to decision makers in the private sector to healthcare providers who are subject matter experts to healthcare consumers who are not. But this is the challenge that we need to overcome in order to ultimately build the resilience that we need uh, to respond to and to prepare for uh, future threats that unfortunately we will inevitably be facing. Uh, so I'm gonna end here and just uh, thank you again for uh, inviting me to be a part of this uh, discussion today. And I will perhaps uh, stop sharing my screen and be happy to take any questions that people might have. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was such a compelling and insightful uh, talk. Um, and yeah, we're open to Q&A and I have a bunch of um, uh, questions that are uh, flowing in. So I'm going to probably combine a few of them because they all kind of touch about the same thing. Um, so it's, so Karen kind of mentioned about how, you know, she's been following you a lot, your story along and knowing that you've pivoted to a more advisory role and tracking the um, effectiveness of various public health interventions. Um, is there anything particularly impactful or uh, when working with policymakers, are there any visual tools or how are you communicating mm -hmm. um, with uh, yeah, policymakers, government, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say, and you know, I suspect that you will find this in your own work, there's a whole variety of different personas that you are, you know, people that you're working with. Um, so even when I think of government alone, I'll just give you uh, some examples. So we work with the public health uh, agencies, we work with departments of defense, because they are thinking about, well, look, where are our forces deployed? If we have a issue with our forces being immobilized, that's a national security risk. Uh, we work with national security entities that are not just thinking about um, uh, threats that may emerge from mother nature, but that actually may come from deliberate acts of bioterrorism. I, for example, was training in New York City in 2001 and post 9-11, 
uh, anthrax was weaponized and sent through the US postal system. So there's a whole world there. We work with um, agriculture sectors as it relates to outbreaks in animals that could lead to food security challenges or, um, or even impact the agriculture sector. So what I will say is that there are a wide variety of different types of uh, users. In some instances, the users actually are just looking to ingest raw data. So we kind of do you know, data as a service because they want to integrate it into their own workflows. In other instances, what we are doing is we are showing the information in a geographic and spatial way because you know everything we often think about, well, where is this happening and when? Mm -hmm. um, but our design team, and I will say, we, we don't actually have the same kind of expertise that um, many of you bring. We have uh, visual designers, people who are, you know, uh, have expertise in user interfaces and user experience. Um, but I think uh, communicating complex information is particularly challenging to the non-subject matter experts. When we're working with the public health agencies, they're like, I got it, I, I know what this is. When we're talking to the chief risk officer in a Fortune 500 company, uh, it's a very different thing altogether. And they're trying to go, is Rift Valley fever? Like, do I do I need to worry about my call center in in you know in Dhaka, or do I need to um, you know is this important or not? So um, so I think we've been doing a lot of experimenting, and I will just say this is uh, an area of development and and a great appreciation for how big of a challenge this is, and but also how incredibly important it is because especially in a public health emergency, you don't have time to sort this out over a month. You may have hours or days to communicate this information. So, um, so I don't have a simple answer for you other than to say it's complex. Uh, and, and this is obviously why the work that you guys are doing is, is so critically important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna move on to the next question. Alex, uh, thanks you for an incredible presentation. And he's curious if Blue Dot is looking to expand the smart triage system to non-HCP consumers. Like for example, if the general like lay consumer can eventually use the app on their phone to say, I'm traveling here for on these dates, what possible infections should I um, take to my GP about? Uh, so, so thank you for the, the kind words and uh, uh, simple answer is yes, absolutely. So the intelligence platform that we have built to date has been focused on supporting large organizations, you know, branches of government at multiple level, you know, just for example, in Canada, we work at the federal government level, at the provincial level, at the municipal level, uh, and then across multiple branches of government. But the rubber really hits the road with the frontline healthcare worker and the citizen. And so, you know, these are where, you know, we can implement as many policies, policies as we like, but we need to be empowering individual actions and behaviors. And so that is absolutely the next frontier. As I was showing there, we've already built out prototypes. We've built out the whole data services and the APIs to connect. Um, but I think the, the challenge for us now, and, and this could be part of an ongoing conversation with, um, this community and, and this program is how do you distill complex information to an audience that is not a subject matter expert in a way that's meaningful, um, easily uh, consumable and, um, and, and doesn't mislead someone with the wrong kind of information. Now, a year ago, we often struggled with this because just candidly, you know, if you told someone, you should be thinking about infectious diseases, the average person laundry would be higher up on the list of priorities or, you know, then I need to think about an infectious disease. Um, so the world's attention was just not really on this particular topic. Now, COVID has obviously changed that. And I think everyone's now thinking about, well, how do we travel? How do we travel safely? How do we protect ourselves? How do we not bring something back into our household and into our workplaces and so forth. So this is absolutely the next frontier. The area where we are going to move slowly on is, you know, uh, the diagnostic support we're providing to healthcare providers. We're just not sure we're ready to actually go to that level of if somebody's sick, you know, we don't want to create hypochondriacs out there of, mm -hmm. of just like querying, you know, what could I have? But we do think that as we go into the future, 
we want to empower the average healthcare consumer who can then have an informed conversation with their healthcare provider. I see this all the time in my work so that if somebody comes back and is sick with an illness, they may go from doctor to doctor to doctor and nobody knows what they have. For the reasons that I mentioned earlier, it's impossible for clinicians to know what's going on across the entire planet. Um, and so we do think that an empowered consumer can mm -hmm. have a more meaningful conversation with their medical provider if they know, I was just in this area, my illness resembles the following diseases, which are known to be in that particular location let me go and have a, a conversation with my doctor who might not even know what's actually happening in that area. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely on the, on the uh, horizon for us. And it is a, uh, a part of our path in, in 2021. Mm -hmm. And this kind of leads into the next question really well, because um, uh, this is a question from Vesta uh, and, and, you know, she's again, commenting very insightful talk. And her question is yeah. more about like, it, it's one thing to, notify people about the potential outbreak and maybe give them the information to make them feel empowered. But that doesn't necessarily mean that um, people will act on it and take preventative measures. So if you could speak a little bit about how would you, what kind of communication strategies would you use to mm -hmm. like move those people who are more resistant? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I think, um, you know, this is now getting into the area of sort of like, uh, behavioral science. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and, and so I think in, in a sense, this is a nascent area for us. The questions that, that um, Avesta is asking are the very questions we're asking. Um, and I think the way we would envision approaching this is we have a very diverse team at Blue Dot, um, veterinarians, physicians, data scientists, epidemiologists, geographers, and so forth. Um, but I think some of the areas that we're going to have to be building our capacity in is I, ideally, I hope this doesn't sound like a plug, but in biomedical communications and, and um, really expanding our capabilities there, but also thinking in things like uh, behavioral science and behavioral economics and so forth around how do we incentivize people to do the right thing? Um, there are the challenge, of course, we all know is that there is a world of misinformation out there as well. And this is where we want to ultimately try and become a really trusted source of information that is timely in ways that, and I say this respectfully, just government just cannot be this quick. It's, this is, I, I don't want to say it's impossible. I would say that it is clearly not the strength of government to be extremely agile. And I think this is what an organization like ours can do is to really be quick and agile and cutting edge in our use of data and analytics and technology um, uh, and, and also to be free of political bias and influence. Unfortunately, we have seen a lot of loss of trust in some of the larger monolithic organizations like the WHO and CDC and so forth. And we really want to be an independent subject area you know, with subject matter expertise uh, to provide a global panoramic view of this type of risk uh, that transcends borders. Uh, and many, many agencies do not actually look at the world in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. All right, thank you for that. Um, uh, I guess maybe to sort of think more about like the future in terms of predicting and tracking epidemiological dynamics, um, what do you see as like the biggest future challenge in that on that front or like big um challenges do you see upcoming for you and blue dot well i think you know first of all that um you know as i mentioned earlier outbreaks are appearing with greater frequency that you know every couple of years we seem to have something it was 2016 was the zika outbreak 2015 there was an outbreak of mers in south korea 2014 was the ebola outbreak you know 2012 was mers 2009 that's 10 years ago we we were in a pandemic the h1n1 flu pandemic so i think the, the challenge is that uh we are likely to be seeing these kinds of threats with greater frequency mm -hmm. um and so what the challenge the biggest challenge today i think is not so much on data analytics and technology, it's the cross-sectoral engagement that needs to happen. You, you need to actually be engaging with, um, you know, branches of government and security and law enforcement and public health and private, the private sector, and to build up these 
preparedness and readiness plans in advance. You don't want to be trying to figure out the fire escape route when the house is engulfed in flames. You, you want to be doing it in advance. And I think the biggest challenge is actually human behavior, which is that when we're not in the middle of a crisis, we tend to forget very quickly. When we're in a crisis, we know how to respond to fast moving threats. The human brain is wired in that way. As soon as a threat diminishes, we tend to you know, discount the significance of the next threat. And so I think the biggest challenge is not going to be technology and data and so forth. I think it's just going to be a focus. Will we be able to maintain focus on the next set of threats when they're not right in front of our face? Mm -hmm. So really, really understanding the audience that you're speaking to and focusing your, um, like your communication strategies around that. And, and, and it's really, it's a two-way street is what I would say is that, you know, what has been really an unexpected, but, but a welcomed um, kind of surprise with this pandemic is that so many different audiences have been engaging with us in ways that we hadn't really anticipated. And it's given us an opportunity to learn, mm -hmm. to learn how does an airport think about this? I mean, you know, we work with Pearson Airport. We work with Air Canada, for example, as some of our clients. Well, how do they think of the, this problem? Um, and prior to that, I wouldn't have had a conversation with people in, in, in those particular areas. I would have been talking to the public health agency. So um, I think uh, really this is a whole of society problem mm -hmm. and it needs a whole of society solution. Um, and so every one of your communication strategies is going to vary with the sector but then even within the sector, is it, you know, we kind of sometimes refer to as metaphorically as like the general's view, the decision maker, or the foot soldier's view of like, I'm on the front lines, like, how do I look at this problem? And uh, I think, you know, what we've built out to date uh, can generate those insights. But now the, the hard work is to translate them into something that is meaningful and easily consumable and seamlessly integrates into people's existing workflows um, rather than creating something else for them to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this is somewhat along that line, but in terms of like when we're thinking about, you know, all the different stakeholders and people you want to collaborate, we have a question from Di uh, Diogo. Uh, where do you see uh, veterinarians um, being involved in this discussion or communication chain and in the strategies regarding zoonosis or even in case of diseases where some animal species are in reservoirs? And he's like, full disclosure, a vet here is so probably biased. He's a vet. Yeah. Is that right? Okay, perfect. You know, well, thank you. I mean, it's music to my ears. We have veterinarians that work at Blue Dot. Uh, so, um, and the reason why is about 75% of all emerging diseases, uh, you know, whether it is H1N1 or Ebola or even HIV or SARS or COVID, uh, these are diseases that have spilled over from animal populations into human populations. And then, you know, we've amplified and disseminated them across the planet. Um, it is critically important that we adopt a One Health perspective, which is that human health is not compartmentalized from the rest of the health of other living systems on our planet, but in fact is deeply intertwined. And this is true with respect to the industrialization of agriculture. If we think about things like influenza viruses, swine viruses, avian viruses, these often come from livestock. But then thinking about other things like novel coronaviruses, like SARS coming from wild animals. So um, I think the key point that, uh, that is being raised here, which is a really important one, and I'm going to take a step away from the, the communication aspect and just say, what we are dealing with today is the symptom mm -hmm. of a broader problem. We haven't really spent a lot of time talking about the underlying root cause. And the underlying root cause and causes are how humans interact with the world around us. And so this is a really important uh, discussion point, uh, perhaps for another day, but an important one for reflection, which is, um, you know, how do we interact with other animal populations and what things are we doing collectively that are creating these sparks uh, where viruses may spill over to human populations and trigger the next dangerous outbreak or the next pandemic. So mother nature is trying to tell us something uh, we just need to make sure that we are listening and we don't get so caught up in the crisis that we forget how it got started in the first place. If we lose that lesson, 
we are going to find ourselves back here again and probably sooner than we would like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank if you. anyone has ever seen the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, I would suggest that you kind of see that his character, Phil, is stuck in the same day over and over again. He's trying to get out of that day and figure out how to live his life. It's almost like the world is stuck in Groundhog Day. We're going, I mean, my career started, if I told you my career started when a novel coronavirus emerged in China, spread around the world and killed frontline healthcare workers and crippled the city, you might think I'd be talking about COVID-19, but I'm talking about SARS. Um, this cycle, we're reliving it. We're going through this cycle over and over again. And so I think uh, the point that was just made uh, is so, so important uh, so that we figure out how to break this cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just gonna, we just have, we're just gonna wrap up now. So just one last question and sure. I'm gonna try to like wrap up a whole bunch of these at the same time. But um, how do you deal with um, areas where the science sort of isn't fully settled or there is very little known about an emerging threat? Um, yeah. Like how do you think through that? Yeah, yeah, well, it's a fantastic question. And I'm, I'm really glad that you, you, you brought it up because Communication also involves communicating uncertainty and what the level of uncertainty is. And I'm sure um, for many of you, how you communicate uncertainty is also a challenge unto itself. And so, you know, we have been doing a lot of work uh, thinking about, you know, we're doing forecasting uh, of uh, COVID-19 activity. Uh, but of course, forecasts are all subject to areas of uncertainty. And in some cases, you know, the, the lower bounds and the upper bounds might actually be in conflict. One might be, hey, it's going to go up a little bit. And the other side might say it may go down slightly. Um, so how do you communicate uncertainty? And this is especially true during a pandemic, which is why I think this is such a great question, is you are learning as you go. You don't have all the answers to start with. You don't know everything about um, this particular virus. And so, you know, as you may have seen during that notification, incubation period mode of transmission was blank. We left it as like, we don't know. We have no idea what this thing is. Um, and as we got more information, we incorporate that in to say, all right, now we understand it's a coronavirus. This is how coronaviruses are typically spread and so on and so forth. So with a newly emerging pathogen, uh, and this is what makes it so difficult, is you are continuously having to update and maybe not reinvent how you communicate, but addressing areas of uncertainty as mm -hmm. new knowledge and information becomes available. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge as you, as you can imagine because uh, the target is moving constantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a really great note to, to land on. You, you know, like it, it, things are very, very uncertain in our world, not just, um, and of course with something like what's happening the, uh, recently with COVID, definitely even more uncertain. And, um, but you know, it, there is, so much effort from everyone towards um, sort of illuminating that uncertainty and continuing to push forward. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much, um, Cameron. This was really, really great. And uh, I'm sure everyone has lots of thoughts floating in their head um, and we really appreciate having you here today. Well, thank you so much. And, and let me just please end by saying um, just how important the work you are do all doing is. Um, and communicating complex information to, to make it, you know, consumable and actionable. Uh, everything we've done from getting to data to insight is only half the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other half is, is, the, is the great work that you are all doing. So thank you for that and, and appreciate uh, you inviting me to be a part of this discussion today. Thank you, Cameron. And we have lots of people giving their thanks in the chat as well. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.